Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about value in flesh and blood. This is a topic that mostly feels conceptual. It's not really super concrete. And I'm here today to tell you that that's pretty much true. It's not really a solidified concept and people's approach to value in flesh and blood can vary sometimes drastically. But there does seem to be enough consensus on hand evaluation in the game that I'm going to talk about my own perception, what I've learned from other players around me, as well as now the prevalence of the topic by Michael Hamilton. I think in the most simple sense, we can break down value as what are cards worth when they're attacking versus what are they worth when they're defending. Since flesh and blood is only a game of attacking and defending, it's a pretty easy metric to go with. A very popular example is Wounding Blow. One of the reasons why is because this is from the original alpha set, Welcome to Wraith. So it's pretty easy to get an idea of where their framework is. This one's pretty simple because it is a zero cost, so it can do everything you would want it to. It can block by itself, it can also attack by itself. And we see what is now going to be known as the common defense value, which is three, and a pretty common, but not entirely common, attacking value of four. But all non-attack actions and attack actions are going to block either two or three in this game. Where we can see the first fundamental of value is the attacking versus defending value of Wounded Blow. We see that it attacks for four, but it only blocks for three. It would be strictly better to attack with this card because you're getting one more point of value on a turn cycle versus blocking with it. Turn cycle normally includes both your opponent's turn and your turn. It's normally considered as the time in the game between when you draw new hands going to be at the end of your turn. The reason why that's relevant is because blocking is just as important if you have a hand that is all wounding blows and you only block with two of them, you get six points of value blocking, but you can only attack with one wounding blow on offense. You just lose an entire card. So it'd be much more optimal to be also blocking with the additional wounding blows. So you can block for nine and attack for four, right, on a turn cycle. Calculating defense values is just as important as offense values. However, we do have defense reactions in Flesh and Blood, which are typically above rate, and they are, of course, usually a much better rate than the defense values of non-attack actions and attack action cards. For example, here we have Flick Black. This is a defense reaction that blocks for four, which is already above the rate of typical three block cards, but also has the added benefit of letting you then block immediately afterwards with a combo card. Instead of blocking for three, it now blocks for five. This lets you block nine value with only two cards, which is above the rate of anything else you can do in the deck. And it's even above rate compared to some of the other generic defense reactions that we'll look at. So we have a movable sync below and fate foreseen. These are cards that block above the rate of non-attack and attack action cards. These cards block for four. For instance, a movable lets you pitch a card, so in essence, using two cards to block up to seven. Although sometimes it can block up to 8 if it's from your arsenal. These effects obviously are very strong, although limited because they're only on the defensive end of what your deck can do. These cards can't attack, they don't have any value on the offense side. Some cards can potentially be above rate but normally have very strong conditional effects. For instance, Snatch, the 0 for 4, which is already starting to creep into the above rate territory of attacking cards does block for two, which is a downside, but if it hits, you do draw a card. And if we're making the assumption that a lot of cards are worth anywhere between maybe three and four damage, even though Michael Hamilton has said that that number possibly has increased a little bit by a, you know, a very small fractional amount, this is still a card that's worth a lot, right? Because if it hits, you're gonna be getting anywhere between, let's say two and maybe four value off of it, right? With the card that you would draw. Now, of course you need a way for this to have go again, or you could just simply arsenal the card that you draw off Snatch. If you already have a card in hand and you don't have a way to give it go again, then it's obviously marginally worse. And you maybe could value as just a zero for four, but the effect does threaten to be above rate, right? You would essentially get an extra card. And so let's say if Snatch hits, this is now a card, a zero for maybe anywhere between seven or eight, but it does have to hit. So your opponent can also, in a sense, go up in value in the exchange by blocking it and denying you the additional value from the on-hit effects. One of the most powerful value lines in Vistrite right now, using a blue to play Mavrian Skies into Shrill the Skull form, and then swinging Rosetta Thorn. Shrill attacks for seven, makes a rune chant, which is gonna come in with Rosetta Thorn. And then if it hits, then you're looking at an extra three arcane damage. However, if your opponent blocks it for seven, then they also deny the three additional rune chants from the Mavrian Skies on hit. So in a sense, you present something that potentially could be above rate and your opponent has the option to also block in a way that puts them above rate. Because if they block for seven, they essentially block for 10. Some cards are incredibly above rate, but only circumstantially or only with synergy with other cards. For instance, Blazing Aether, 
can often be worth anywhere between 10 and 20 damage, sometimes more on Kano combo turns. The card by itself does zero damage. So this is a card that would be incredibly above rate to the point that almost no other card can outmatch it, but it also could be entirely worthless. Of course, we can pair this side by side with Aether Wildfire. These two are often played together, but Aether Wildfire is just two cards for four damage. Of course, this has a combo style effect on it. And at the end of the turn, if you were able to combo with Aether Wildfire, then this card can be worth sometimes four times what you initially got out of it. So in that case, it's above rate. That is difficult because these are effects that can be shut down by your opponent. Something like Wax On is a one card that blocks for five, which is much more above rate than even the most powerful generic D React. Also, we have something like Mirage and Metamorph. It's a one for seven, but it does have Phantasm. So if your opponent blocks with a six power, even if it only blocks for two, they essentially turn a two block into a seven block. Now, Mirage and Metamorph does have a downside for triggering the Phantasm, but a lot of the Illusionist attacks have this downside. They're incredibly overstatted, but it does have the effect of letting your opponent also block above rate. You can attack above rate, but your opponent can also block and deny you that. For instance, if you play Rhinar into Prism, basically all of your cards block anywhere between five and seven damage. To go back into the idea of decks winning on turn cycles, there are a lot of decks that only like to attack with their weapon. The reason why is because their weapon is often overrate or it just being one card and they can block freely with the rest. For instance, we're going to be valuing most turn cycles at 12 damage and you're a deck that can block with three three blocks and then use, for instance, in dash, a blue to use plasma pistol induction chamber and then shoot your plasma pistol then in that sense you are one above your opponent in the value exchange because you block nine but you've also sent four every turn so you're dealing 13 points of value and your opponent is only doing 12. So over the long course of a game you're going to be ahead over your opponent winner's whale is an exception of a small amount of power creep because while romping club sometimes can attack for five and anothos can attack for six although it is less efficient because instead of turning one card into four damage you turn two cards into six damage it doesn't scale as well winner's whale also has the additional disruption which is the frostbite which depending on who you ask can be worth anywhere between one and two points of value so in that sense oldham is even more ahead on the turn cycles because if we're going to be valuing it even at one point of value denying your opponent one resource during their turn that is still in a sense five value but now you're two above your opponent who's having an average on rate turn cycle so let's look at a quick example so here we just have some basic elemental cards we have a winner's bite a breakground two autumn touches one of them's blue one of them's red so let's say we want to have the most effective turn Turn cycle. We could start by thinking about is blocking with our most impactful three blocks. So if we want to block with both of our autumn's touch, we want to use Ulm's ability to pitch the breakground to prevent two damage, and then we would swing the winner's whale with the ice card. In that sense, we're dealing 13 on the turn cycle, which is above rate. But is there any other way that we can structure this hand? Well, we could block with the blue autumn's touch, the breakground, prevent five, and then swing the red autumn's touch, but then that's only 12, so that's worse. We could also fully block with the hand and prevent 10, but that's also worse than doing 13. However, this does become more tricky because it also is contextual based on what our opponent has attacked us with. It may be better for us to fully block out because perhaps at the end our opponent played Snatch. And it's better for us to block with a card and a piece of armor to prevent the on hit because that's worth more taking the four damage plus and getting a new card to arsenal than swinging the winner's whale so this isn't a perfect analysis and it's going to require a lot of problem solving a lot of critical thinking during your games it's not going to be super clear all the time but hopefully this is just a small introductory way to get you thinking about what it means when people talk about value so to quickly reiterate what we just talked about we're really just comparing the attacking stats, the defending stats of cards. We're looking at what the averages are. Often if you're able to get a turn cycle that is 16 or higher, you are above rate, which means that you're playing on a higher average than what most other decks are able to do. This of course can be with a little bit of variance. For instance, sometimes you will get hands that are way above rate, and sometimes you'll get hands that are below rate, even when blocking. That's just the nature of the game. But what is important to keep in mind is, what are my cards worth on offense versus defense? Is this the right time to block? Is this the right time to attack? What is the optimal amount of damage I can do with my hand while blocking with none of cards possible? My hand only work better on offense? Does it only work better on defense? It requires a lot of practice, requires a lot of patience, learning the game. You have to learn ways that you need to deny your opponent from going above rate. For instance, that example with not letting Red Mavrian Skies hit, not letting Snatch hit. Even if your cards would naturally be better on offense, the chances are that unless if they're incredibly above rate compared to the on hits, 
probably better off blocking the card. And this is why it's also good to include these cards in your deck, because you often will require your opponent to block cards that would be better on rate attacking. Uh, you can always be above your opponent's numbers. Keep that process turn after turn after turn, and you don't drop that fundamental, and you're always paying attention to your hand, paying attention to what cards you should block with, what cards you should block, and when to block, when to attack, I think it'll just propel you along the learning curve. And this game has an incredibly high learning curve, incredibly steep, so this is just a very, once again, abstract concept that I am just trying to uh, relay information on, my own perception, how I've viewed the game for a while, and it has paid off pretty well for me, so it's important to learn. But let me know in the comments what you think, if you have a different analysis of people mean when they talk about Valley and Flesh and Blood, anything you think I missed. Well, next time, thank you for watching.